a record-breaking 10,000 mourners pay their final respects to the Nazi war criminal in West Germany in 1961. How on earth could this event transpire just a couple of years after the Nuremberg trials in a country that ostensibly had lost all respect for their ex-Nazi leadership and henchmen? After they let the whole of Germany burn instead of surrendering after any hope of victory was lost in Second World War. But alas, even the West German Chancellor sent his sympathies to the dead ex-SS commander of the Hitler Youth Division. The dead man in question was the fanatical Nazi supporter Kurt Meyer, affectionately named Panzermeyer by his comrades. 16 years prior in 1945, he had been found guilty of three counts of war crimes by the Canadian War Tribunal and sentenced to death by firing squad for the direct responsibility for his troops killing dozens of Canadian prisoners of war held in German captivity on the two days after the D-Day landing. A sentencing that was subsequently lessened to life in prison due to the sympathetic Canadian tribunal members who equally had ordered their soldiers to take no prisoners at certain times during the war. Panzermeyer was out after nine years for good behavior and proceeded to be active and finally president of the SAS apologist organization Hayek and their most effective spokesperson. He wrote and aided the publication of several books espousing the fiction that the Waffen SS, the combat branch of the Nazi paramilitary SS organization, had no involvement in war crimes, glorifying the SS contribution to the war, and even suggesting the absurd idea that the SS, who often recruited in the right-wing extremist groups in German-occupied Europe, was the forerunner to NATO, fighting against the communist threat from the East. So how on earth did a convicted war criminal manage to garner enough sympathy that 10,000 people and the German Chancellor himself treated this man as a most honored war hero? It boggles the mind. I believe the background here really can be found in the very weak attempt of denazification conducted in West Germany after the war, as the Americans and British were much more preoccupied with the threat of communism and building up West Germany as a buffer state towards the East. It is a fact that more than 50% of administrators in post-war West Germany were affiliated with the Nazi party, trusted to be anti-communist, compared to East Germany, where there were barely any and where the Holocaust was much more openly tackled early on. Of course, for ideological reasons themselves. It is important to understand that the German cultural movement to come to terms with the past only really kicked off after the reunification in 1990. Equally important is probably to understand and empathize with the lost surviving sons of a criminal Germany who had backed the Nazis and felt totally lost and disrespected for their significant sacrifice and effort of their army units. No wonder they much preferred their comrades' company where one could feel understood and who supported each other in finding jobs and handling their many prosecutions. Not to mention a safe space for continued support for their ideology of Nazism and anti-Semitism that were no longer openly tolerated in society. Yes, the SS survivors were in a complete siege mentality, and understandably so, even as the intolerance these people were met with was fully justified. The many participants to the funeral of the leader Kurt is testament to the size of this organization at movement. A movement large and important enough that the Chancellor Adenauer had courted them for their votes. However, we must see through Panzermeyer's wish to disregard the rather low standard of evidence that convicted him as a war criminal, as well as his attempts to equivocate some of their crimes with the opponents. There were plenty of war crimes to go around in the Waffen SS, and he was only charged with crimes against Canadians, despite his unit and overwhelmingly likely himself as their commander, being part of, if not fully responsible for, so many other outright criminal episodes. Even inside his prior unit, the SS Hitler bodyguard, during the invasion in the East, he became infamous for mass murdering civilians and burning down whole villages. For example, accused of participating in murdering 50 Jews in Poland in 1939, or murdering 50 women and children in Rovno in 1941. Later again, in 43, he is believed to have ordered the murdering of an unbelievable 872 men, women and children in Yevromovka with 240 being burned alive in the church before the whole village was burned to the ground. Both local survivors, the Soviets and ex-SS men, all corroborated the story independently after the war. Only a few days later, Kurt was awarded the Knight's Cross with oak leaves for his heroic actions. 
a medal proudly exhibited at his funeral procession. It is criminal and disgusting in of itself that the Soviets themselves decided not to pursue charges against Panzermeyer for any of this, granting him the chance to lie and obfuscate about his and the record of the Waffen-SS. This all happened with the express endorsement of Adolf Hitler, of course, who proclaimed to all his soldiers that the war in the East had to be waged with utmost brutality and that their opponents were subhumans. However, it wasn't only with this pathetic excuse that war crimes were conducted against civilians by the 12th SS, whom Kurt claimed never committed any crimes. On the 1st of April 1944, when their train was slightly derailed en route to Normandy, but without any injury to anyone aboard, the SS men quickly went to town in the nearby village, arresting all the men. Altogether, 70 men were shot besides the railway line and another 16 in the village itself. The SS men upheld that only escaping prisoners were shot, claim that does not stand up to the slightest of scrutiny. How and why should all these civilians have attempted to escape after being arrested? It was not normal for civilians to be executed, so why would they necessarily fear for their lives unless they were guilty? But surely local civilians would not be so stupid or naive to commit sabotage on a railroad line right next to where they and their families lived, endangering everybody. It is impossible to imagine. The Nazis also later stated that all the dead were terrorists, which justified the murders. Why invent this additional myth if they were already shot on the grounds of escaping? Clearly nobody believed any of it. Additionally, the SS men proceeded to loot the houses and rob the corpses after these justified killings. None of these events or accusations were even engaged with, let alone mentioned, in the memoirs of the SS men, and Panzermeyer and many of his fellow soldiers showed little to no respect or sympathy for the civilian victims of war, despite being loud voices for the lack of rights for the ex-SS servicemen. The hypocrisy is quite unbearable. Luckily, some historians have taken it to task to write extensively about the crimes of the Waffen-SS for the record, but to this day you find people defending, for example, the 12th SS Division on the basis of the ridiculous narrative laid out in their own selected memoirs, describing them as the most brave soldiers and never engaging seriously with the numerous accusations of war crimes. A brave move came from Panzermeyer's son in 1998, who wrote about how his father hung up a picture of Hitler when he returned home from Allied prison after ostensible rehabilitation. He critically examined his father's life story and described his father as trapped in his glorious past. I say brave as his mother was furious about this book, considering it a complete betrayal of her now dead husband. It is safe to say that these people never came to grips with the criminality and horrors of the Nazi era. And it is no coincidence that much of the German soul searching on the topic of this era could only commence once most of the likes of these men were dead and buried.